All right, I'd like to call uh, to order the ordinance meeting of January, whatever today's date is, so that's the 9th, 17th. Um, can we have a roll call, please? Council Hamill? Here. Council Holling? Here. Council Gathering? Here. Here. Um, well, can we have approval of the minutes from the October 18th meeting? Any discussion? It's not the tenants, but they seem well in order. <laughs> can I have a motion for approval? So moved. Sorry. All in favor? Okay. Uh, today we're going to do a presentation on marijuana survey results and next steps. Uh, amendments to purchasing policy, traffic ordinance, garbage recycling, collection and disposal, and shellfish. Um, at this point, I would like to invite members of the public to come or stand, and you're going to have to grab one of that mic there and speak into the mic, and um, three, try to keep it to three minutes. Any comments on anything that's on this agenda would be bad. Oh, Mr. Hall's going to help us here. Would be great. Anyone wish to speak from the public? Are, are we allowed to after you address the Well, we're going to do it now. No. No. I'll hold on. No? Okay. This is your chance to make it. So well, unlike a council meeting. Unlike a council meeting. Where it's on, on each agenda item, it's okay. done in advance. Okay. Right? Right. Let's make it sure they... Okay. All right. Okay. Hearing none, uh, we will go right into uh, Mr. Hall's yes. discussion of the marijuana survey results in the next step. Yes, I'll do my best. Uh, Larissa Crockett, the assistant town manager, really led up this effort, and she may want to fill in some gaps, but I've, I've had the occasion to speak to her on a couple of occasions, and I'm pleased to share some of the preliminary results from our survey. So, some background here. We used the opportunity leading up to the election uh, during the absentee period. We had actually a desk and some computers right out here in the, in the lobby uh, and invited folks to take a survey uh, if they wished. And then again at election day, I think Larissa was there most of the day, probably eight of the 12 hours or so. Uh, and in total, we were able to get 268 respondents uh, to the survey. And essentially, we were looking at each community interest in both um, various uh, types of medical and, and adult use activities. And that includes cultivation, manufacturing, testing, and then retail sales. So the survey was designed um, uh, to, to gauge appetite and interest along those lines. Um, there were some, some results, I, I will say at the outset, um, and, and this is really born out of the fact that Larissa was actually there at the booth, often interacting with the folks before, after, or during their uh, taking the survey. And there did seem to be uh, a lot of confusion around the state laws, what they are, what they aren't, taxation, regulation. And so uh, one comment she's made over and over to me is that um, there there's just a, seems to be a lot of misinformation and whether there could be some further purpose served by uh, some education around that and it may change people's opinion about one thing or another. So I just kind of offer that uh, at the outset. So as I said earlier, we. The questions really uh, surrounded themselves around both medical uh, marijuana and adult use marijuana. And I'll share some basic results and I'm, I'm trying to consolidate them just so we can draw maybe some basic conclusions. So for the first set of questions, and this is just general support of both medical and or adult use, and it was uh, they were asked to rate things on a one to five scale, uh, five being the highest. And so uh, I've combined the statistics for uh, four and five. And, um, my theory being that, that someone's indicating general support if they're voting four or five. And so on the issue of medical marijuana, general support for it, uh, over 70% of respondents uh, said that they were generally support. And uh, that's to be compared to just under 50% for the adult use. Ranked a four or five to that question. Uh, beyond that, we delved into the details of each of those kind of uh, uh, use types, if you will. So, the question of medical marijuana cultivation, and here I consolidated uh, all responses that had a yes that led uh, with, the, with the election that they chose. Uh, and nearly 75% of folks had some degree of yes, if you will, to 
medical marijuana cultivation as compared to about 62% for um, adult use cultivation. And this is a trend that you'll see through the other use types. Uh, there's higher acceptance apparently of medical marijuana than there is adult use. Um, for each of these sets of questions, we did allow folks to comment, and so there's comments provided. I'm, I won't go through them, but they're there for you to read. I believe they are issued, they printed uh, kind of verbatim. You didn't use any editorial license. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you want perhaps some further insight. So the next category is uh, the area of manufacturing. So for medical marijuana manufacturing, uh, again, above 75% response rate of uh, folks in the yes category of one sort or another, with some reservation perhaps, but generally yes. To be compared to just over 61% for medical, excuse me, for adult use um, manufacturing. Very similar trend to what we saw uh, with the first set of questions. Again, their comments were provided um, for your review if you like. Moving on to testing, uh, medical marijuana testing. Oh, it's on question. Yes. So I, I'm just kind of curious, uh, this is a question for the committee, for you and the committee. Is, are, is there an opportunity to respond to some of the comments you're making along the way? Uh, and then, if so, is that like it as we go or hold the questions to the end? Why don't we just hold it? Right. Give me 30 seconds and I think I can move through the, the rest of it and then I can drop back. Thank you. So the next one uh, focused on testing, so for medical marijuana testing facilities, again just over 75% were in the general yes category, perhaps with some reservation, and um, for adult use testing facilities, 65% or almost 66%. That's gone up slightly from the other two questions, it seems. Uh, again, comments uh, were provided. And lastly, on retail, uh, I chose to look at it uh, in the inverse, I guess, for those that either said no or weren't sure. And for uh, medical marijuana retail establishments, 44.9% uh, said they said no or they weren't sure about it. The other ones were in some variation of yes. And then for adult use, Adult use retail, 55% either said no or they weren't sure. So I guess to sum it up, it appears as though cultivation, manufacturing, and testing enjoyed more consistent, uh, more majority support than did the retail component. And I guess these results are not surprising given the kind of narrow support shown in the referendum initially on the matter. I don't recall exactly, but it was a 59 40. 51, 49, or something like that, vote very evenly split. And so uh, we're pleased to take your questions uh, about this and uh, as to the next steps. Uh, but I do want you to just keep in mind that, uh, at least from Lotus's point of view, there does seem to be still some misinformation or miscommunication out there, whether there's some extra efforts we could do to fill in some of those gaps and whether that would change the results. So we don't know. Tom, yes. Tom, do you have questions? Yeah, I have uh, a number of questions. Number one, uh, thanks, Tom, for uh, running through this and and uh, you know doing a very good summary of, of the results, you know, which is uh, not easy to do. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention that I thought that the idea of doing a survey is a good idea. However, you know, some caution with that. I mean, one is the uh, you know, the, the number of respondents, I mean, if you take that as a percentage of 268, uh, as a percentage of uh, voters, I mean, it's something like, it's less than 2%. So, so my caution would be, uh, if we're trying to draw hard and fast conclusions from that, we really ought to be, you know, circumspect about it. The other one is even Tom, as you're running through this, I know the two the two favorable categories were yes, and then there was a yes but. Uh, if you don't include the yes buts with the yeses, then and some of these the overall rating actually would have been unfavorable. So the the distinction between yes and yes but was yes I have no preference as to where the facilities are located, 
and uh, yes, but only in industrial areas. So, so if you, if you, you know, if the results swing either way, you can make the argument either way, depending upon how you classify and characterize the, you know, the, uh, the yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to package them by saying there's general support with reservation, and it's really the yes, but that uh, would give you some further insight from a policy perspective. Uh, first and foremost, whether you want to take it up at all, because this is opt-in, you don't need to. Uh, and if you do, this starts to help you understand, okay, we're going to do it, but only in these uh, yeah. carefully thought of areas. Yes. Fair point. So anyway, that, that I just wanted to kind of call those things out as a, you know, it's kind of jumped out at me and it might be helpful also for the, the public to, to know about that and read that in a similar fashion. Fair point. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I would share the concern around, um, you know, number of responses. That's not a, a legitimate sample size in order to draw, you know, definitive conclusions. Um, I do think it's informative, though, and that's always helpful. Uh, I was actually there uh, for a good two, three hours in the morning with the polls, and so I was I was one of the people trying to get people to take the, the survey, and so I would, that enabled me to have some conversations. And it was, I would echo what Larissa said around um, the need, people were very confused about the whole issue still. It's quite, you had to kind of break it down in terms of what this piece meant, that piece meant, and the yes buts were um, probably the most interesting part of those conversations. So um, not, you know, any wild, crazy, complete opposition, but let's do this carefully and, and right. So my going forward, that would just be my, um, my, maybe we can do some additional education and outreach uh, and also get continued to solicit uh, more opinions. Anything else? Um, my comments on this are, I also spent some time um, at the polls with Larissa uh, and talked with people, and I saw the same confusion with people. Uh, people either had a real knee jerk, are you kidding me? <laughs> or, well, tell me more. Uh, so definitely some more, I see more education and outreach uh, needed before uh, we can do much with that. Uh, Tom, just for purpose of people um, who are listening in and the general public, could you tell the difference, tell us the difference between cultivation, manufacturing, and testing? Because that's, I mean, do you know that? I will ask that, because I know Morris has been to the workshops, yeah, yeah. I've done a lot of that. I can only be speaking. speculating, uh, I probably don't have the, any deeper understanding than you do, but uh, as the name suggests, cultivation is the actual growing of right. product, manufacturing would be some level of processing right. uh, to a, a product ready for sale, whether that would be uh, uh, marijuana in, in its raw sense, or it may include uh, edibles and, and mm -hmm. uh, extractions um, as well. I'm sure I'm not giving all of that justice, whereas testing would be, uh, this ends up being, I think, a pretty critical point that uh, these products, consumables, need to be uh, tested for uh, their strength and so on and so forth. So um, I think that is very much a laboratory space uh, as, as far as I know. I think there's some particular regulations around what security details that need to be around them. Uh, but fairly enough, it was provided on some that would be a quick perspective, I would expect. And retail, as the name suggests, would be for the actual sale of the product. Um, with that being said, I, I would echo, as I said, uh, education and, and outreach. And towards that, Tom, I believe you had a discussion with Larissa. Today. Yeah, she would like to host uh, a couple of public forums to invite folks in to hopefully uh, you know, have some level of presentation to lay some, some of that educational groundwork, uh, but also engage in some conversation if, if uh, the format and forum and kind of the the number of attendees allow. Um, we'll have to take that as it comes. Um, as we're discussing this, our neighbors are as well. Uh, so Portland's made some final decisions uh, and actually granted, I think, some approvals recently. Uh, Portland is right on the doorstep of doing the same and doing some really good work that we could possibly benefit from if, if in fact, we want to take these things up and consider one or more of these options. Um. Thoughts on behavior on the 
services. I, I love the idea of a public forum. Um, gives people space to actually have dialogue instead of being talked at. <laughs> you know, I'm always preaching that. So um, that's a great next step. Yeah, I'm, I'm in support of that as well. My nice first step is particularly on raising awareness and education on the issues. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see as part of the forum are people who are involved in the various aspects of. So maybe this is some intentional invites. Right, intentional invites yeah. uh, for the education purposes. Because God knows I'm not the expert. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see people who are involved in the industry. Find some folks who are very intentionally. I think she's been in a case with a number of folks right along. Um, if not, you can seek me out or Lursa. We'll make sure to give you an invite. If not, a seat at the table to help inform the conversation. Uh, I'm pleased you were willing to take this up. And uh, again, I'm sure I didn't do it complete justice, but um, folks have been very patient uh, and are anxious to see what the future looks like. So. Uh, this we don't lose a month. Uh, we're right. go about the business, and perhaps we can have one for your next meeting about two. So well, it's going to be my question. When does she want to start this? If I know her at all, and I know her well, I think she'll <laughs> yes, get right okay. on. Um, <laughs> so, at the very least, at your next meeting, we likely will be able to report on at least our first one, okay. and uh, maybe even two. But uh, I don't want to promise that yet. Okay. Anything else on this subject? Okay. All right, that being said, let's move on to the next subject, which is, oh, um, let's move on what we want to do. So we want, I'm sorry, make a motion that um, for this five move to improve the assistant town manager to move forward with uh, hosting public forum uh, to gather more information. Second. All in favor? Uh, could I also, I'm going to say uh, that we will put this back on the schedule for next month, the next ordinance, just so we have more information. Okay? Thank you. All right, the next subject is purchasing policy. Yeah. Marissa is the purchasing agent. Uh, so she's brought forward a number of changes. Uh, I believe they're fairly self evident. Yes, You've got a straight through normal line version in front of you. Um, much of this is to modernize and, and really mirror the actual practice. Uh, you know, rather than posting uh, individual bid on the voting board, we do have a uh, portion of the website uh, where all of that business is conducted. So it's really just uh, trying to align the policy with our current and long standing practice, frankly. Questions of uh, the proposed changes? Uh, I, uh, I have a question, just sort of as a, a new guy. Um, can you give me a back, little background on the origin of it? And, you know, how, I know you touched on it very briefly, but could you go into a little more detail about that? Well, it predated me. Uh, I, I don't have the actual appropriation given the original public in the front here, 1994. Apparently, we've had it since then. Uh, actually, when I was hired, we had a full-time purchasing agent, and, uh, and we left for another position. We chose not to fill it, and uh, Larissa has assumed those duties. I've had them through the years as well. This is really intended to regularize our purchasing practices. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the advice of our auditors and uh, the uh, government finance uh, officers association gives some uh, pretty clear guidance in these re regards. So these are the rules for all departments to understand and, and to follow when it comes to purchasing. And the real intent of this is to really centralize the purchasing to make sure we can uh, capture economies of scale, make sure the, the, the process is fair, open, competitive, uh, all of which is intended to obviously uh, get the best pricing. Okay. I did have a couple of detailed questions. You know, the first, you know, the definitions of approved vendors, you know, are there no longer any approved vendors, or how does that work? I noticed that once that section was struck. It's not a practice that we've used since I've been here, frankly, and, I, and we're just, that's one of those modernizations. Uh, and I'm not sure what purpose would be served. Um, so it's really uh, something that we don't do. 
So another one on purchase limits, I read this one, I'm not sure I have it straight, but it looks like they were uh, purchasing approval authority uh, and was low, was reduced uh, for apartment heads from 2,500 to 500. So I think it's from 200, it's being raised oh, from I'm 200 sorry. to 500. I see, so it's raised, okay, I, I read that wrong. Okay. <laughs> The other one, number two under section five, yeah. uh, computer hardware and software. Yeah. This is really to make sure departments uh, the, use the technical resources in IT and yeah. coordinate all of those purchases so we can be brand specific. And uh, it's really worked out well for us, whereas in the past, everyone's kind of doing their own thing. And, uh, this, this adds a lot more centralization to, uh, to all computer hardware and software. So we're raising, we're, uh, that makes sense to me, so I just want to go back to this thing again about so we're raising the uh, purchase price limits, and that means we are actually allowing more autonomy and trying to uh, centralize only the bigger, the really big purchases. Yes, the, the, the same uh, objectives I think are achieved, we're looking to modernize the amounts. This is not terribly time sensitive, so yeah. I'm pleased to have this carry on and go ahead and next one if you wish. My, oh, go ahead. Um, so my only question was what, so when you say modernize, right? That's just basically people times with inflation, more or less. Yep. Uh, I, I like the, I'm the simple girl, don't get this down. Okay, let's make it simple. Um, when was this, so what, how long ago was? For example, on page three under section six, number two, uh, how long ago was that $7,500? How long has it been since it's been updated? Yeah, I'll have to look. You can see the amendment yeah. dates in the front. Uh, I would simply go back and look to see which of the which uh, yeah. amendments were done. Okay, I just didn't know I, if you knew which I don't know if I'm talking about it. Okay. Find out what you know. Yeah. Um, that was my only question. So if that was last year's, then. I can say, to my recollection, my ten years has often changed since uh, since then uh, during my tenure. But uh, I'm pleased to do the research and uh, defensively. We can have this come back next month again. It's not no shadow of time. I I just like a little more time to to uh, you know, get my head around it. I mean, in general, I I uh, I, look, I like what you've done in terms of uh, you know eliminating a position and incorporating that and.
Second. us to here with me. I'm scrolling down. Oh, traffic. And if I could ask if you could to grab that mic <laughs> for 20 minutes and explain what we're doing here. No. <laughs> Didn't want to see that. Uh, fairly simple, I think, actually. Good afternoon, first of all. Um, a fairly simple uh, explanation is uh, we've always had no parking anywhere in Scarborough uh, from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, recognized with the growth of the town that it may be beneficial to have uh, that ordinance still in existence except for the exclusion of designated parking areas. So, uh, for example, uh, East Grand Avenue, where there are designated parking areas, uh, those parking areas would be excluded from the no parking 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Neighborhoods that didn't have designated parking areas, uh, lined areas on the roadway, would still remain no parking 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. That's typically much. And so, I'm worried. Is there a driveway? I think it came about from several, several different sources. Uh, one of the changes we made to, to it was to uh, encompass roadway uh, as opposed to the overall uh, roadway from boundary to boundary. Uh, we included a basically a paved surface. The definition already existed in our windows is the paved travel portion that you can't park on. Which helps us in Davis Beach area, for example, where people park on their lawn. It's actually in the right of way of the roadway. Um, exclude them from this no parking area uh, and help them be in compliance. So that is a slight change, and uh, that was part of this as well. And then there's some future growth plans. We've seen some areas that are including on street parking as part of the growth plan uh, for the residential areas that we uh, 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 Yeah. Because those are defined terms. 
And then this other part has to do with a different policy decision whether we want to do that overnight parking and designated spaces. I'm curious about Kate's speech then, because that's, that's time limited. It is. I think part of the, uh, part of the ordinance says where signage uh, doesn't exclude that as well. But I think you'll find that in Kate's speech, there's plenty of signage that indicates it would not be lawful to park in a designated spot down there because there is no parking in that area after a certain hour. So it would exclude those designated parking spots. I personally don't have an issue with it. I know I've, in my travels, I, I've seen in a number of communities in different states or whatever, you see actual signs that will say, uh, all four wheels have to be off the pavement. I've, did, I've actually seen that, you know. So it's like, I don't have an issue so that. And it says, uh, unless otherwise restricted in the ordinance. Am I wrong in saying the other places in town, the only other places that we have designated on street parking spaces are East Grand Avenue, Jones Creek, and the lower end of Pine Point? I can't think of another place other than Higgins where there's designated on street parking. I believe you're correct. This time. And, uh, you know, if you had to ask me right now, I, have, I think I have a hard time, even though I you know, live in the neighborhood, I can see both sides of it. People arguing energetically, you know, <laughs> both sides of the issue. Maybe that cancels it, you know, cancels things out, and we go ahead with it. But I, it's something that's been in place for a long time, uh, and um, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I'd be interested in you know other other feedback. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the real issue comes that you're right. It has been in place for a long time, and how people always use discretion about it. You know, where it becomes an issue and where it doesn't. And when this particular situation came forward, and we were made aware, or, or the gentleman brought it to our attention, that we're technically in violation, and therefore we should be uh, ticketing this particular vehicle. The issue that I had was it's very difficult for me to say, I want you to ticket, uh, to ticket that situation, but for all of these other folks that happen to live at Higgins Beach or Pine Point or whatever, who are also parked in the right way, leave them alone. So that became the issue. Um, you know, honestly, we've never had any real issues. Our people are used to the discretion. I think they've used it wisely, realizing that there are driveways that you don't have any choice but to have a part of your vehicle in what is technically the right of way. But as long as it wasn't in the road, we didn't, uh, we didn't have any issue with that. But when this particular situation came up, and it was kind of forcefully uh, put out there about uh, you know, the fact that we have a violation and we're not dealing with that, our options are to say, yeah, we're going to deal with that, but we're also going to have to deal with all of these other situations, which I think would be unintended consequences, or we're going to have to look at the ordinance and see how we can make it match um, what our, what our uh, practices are. So I understand the rationale and how we got here, and I am very sensitive, uh, Chief, and uh, uh, sorry uh, about the pressure it puts on you know your your units to have to use your discretion and you know, uh, you know uh, make your job proper. So I'm, I'm you know, sensitive and sympathetic to that, uh, but I I can't say for sure that this would be. Uh, you know, a good thing in those areas that you mentioned where there are designated spaces because of the seasonal impact. I don't really know. I mean, obviously, it's not an issue, but I, I could see potentially a big row and potentially abuses um, you know, all around in terms of people using you know, those spaces overnight. Well, it says here except within designated parking spaces. So, so it I, says, unless otherwise restricted, no online parking upon any roadway except within designated parking spaces between the hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. But it's a, we're working from the negative here. So two negatives means it's positive. That means it's okay, it would be okay to park overnight on East Grand Avenue and the places the where there are designated spots. 
Yeah. There are really two policy decisions here. The first right. one, I think, is dealt with by the change from Ward Street to Roadway. That would satisfy right. the initial issue that brought yeah. these gentlemen right. to yeah. you. That's the the second one was an uh, outgrowth of yeah. that conversation, yeah. but it's independent of. Yeah. But let me just make it so I'm clear. When you make that change from street to roadway, you're now including that three foot. Excluding. 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 Okay, so it makes your life easier now yes. at places yes. like Biggest Beach and why not? The people who are visiting can park on the grass and it's fine. Right. Yes. Okay. I was I was yes. interpreting the, the opposite right. way and right. I was thinking, well, you know, but I don't feel bad for your discretion. Discretion is the middle name of a police officer. Right? <laughs> like everything you do is discretionary. <laughs> So, okay, but I do want to make your lives easier. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm more satisfied now. I was so thinking... It's okay to park on your lawn. Yes. Um, and it would not be okay to park in the designated spaces overnight. As I understand it, no, no, no. you're saying... Lawns. Yeah, I know. It's hard for me to... Uh, and, and unless otherwise, you back to unless school, otherwise you're restricted. There's no all night parking upon any roadway except with designated parking spaces. So on East Grand, in those designated parking spaces, you're fine. And you're okay. in the designated parking spaces, you're fine. On your lawn, you're fine. fine. Just keep your wheels off the pavement. Right, but your but overnight parking is not currently allowed in designated parking spaces on East Grand Avenue and Jones Creek. This would allow that. This proposed change would allow that. They're saying yes. And what I'm saying is that as a long-term resident of High Point, I can tell you this will be a loud and Why? you know unruly issue. Not that the, that's typical for High Point. But <laughs> that it's going to be. Don, correct me if I'm wrong. This stands to benefit probably those that live there yeah. or have vacation rentals. Yep. Yeah. I would expect a concern maybe from uh, losing access to the beach. Uh, I think I think where the the questions will come will be like folks who come for the day or they've got campers and you know fit in a space or two, and they would uh, um, be able to park there overnight. Mm -hmm. and I can see the concern yeah. with the camper. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I I if I could. Just step us back a bit. Yeah. Remember, this is an ordinance committee. Yeah. So our job is that we're going to send this forward to the council because yeah. the council's going to then yeah. take it up and have yeah. the readings and get hear yeah. from the people Thank you. and whatever. So Thank we aren't making the decision. I understand. Uh, we're just making the yeah. decision is this worth sending to the council? I would observe that we may be, uh, this may be a solution searching for a problem. Yeah. And, and just. We ended with this conversation, we didn't start with it. The yeah. threshold question can be satisfied with a simple word change of yeah. roadway instead of street. Yeah. This other piece can yeah. not go forward if you don't wish to. The thing that's missing for me is public input. So I have a point of view. Uh, well, that would be in the council, so let's send it. Uh, and then what's, what would the sign be for that? Like next meeting kind of thing? Or? You ever talk to the chair? <laughs> My experience particularly with Five Point or any kind of organized neighborhood, um, it's, we probably ought to do some outreach beforehand. Uh, yeah. I don't like to sit the council up for uh, the tangle of people avoided. So why don't we seek some input for our next, for our next meeting? Okay. Make the decision then. I'm ready to move it to the council. Because I've been on ordinance and have heard all of the yeah. whatever they hear. So. so, but I'm just curious of what would be the public forum for that before it gets before the council. Because I, you know, I, I'm not interested in in delaying this unnecessarily. But I, I think it's an important step step to solicit and educate and see if people are okay with that. I'm not again, I'm not opposed to it, but I can't really speak for. Um, what the public might say. Uh, Fair enough, and I think that purpose can be served through the council's multiple hearing process, if you will. But so are you like a workshop or something like that? Uh, or are you, uh, I mean, I think we can engage the Pine Point neighborhood yeah. residents themselves yeah. and get some very yeah. sense of how that group feels. You're right, the public at large is not likely served in that purpose. But I'd be interested in particular in those areas that do have designated spaces 
you know, just to make sure that we've done the sweep, so we talk to these small centers, what they said or didn't say, um, just so we can do that. So, so, what's your... so can I make a motion? Yes. So I, uh, I'll make a motion that we solicit input from the uh, residents in the neighborhoods where there are designated spaces that would be uh, directly affected by this, you know, one could be positively or negatively, but that we would do that step um, before this. Uh, prior to prior. referring to council. Correct, thank you. Any more uh, discussion? Well, I was just saying, so like, I know we hear this a lot, oh, I didn't know about this, and if I'm, you know, Joe Schmo in the public and I'm looking at the agenda, I'm like, oh, is there anything important there to me? The one thing that's, that, that just stood out that I just thought of it to know is traffic ordinance. I don't necessarily equate traffic with parking. And so if I have concerns about parking, no matter what that might be, uh, if it had said parking, <laughs> that might have triggered me. So maybe in part why we don't have anybody here today is because they're like, oh, they're going to talk about red lights and speeds or something. You know, traffic to me just indicates something different. So um, I, I could go either way, but I'd like to support uh, Councillor Hamill's desire for some more input and see what we can get and then move it forward mm -hmm. relatively quickly from there. And even though I would like to see it go right to Council in order to go along to get along, I will vote for that. Thank you. We can we can move it one more, one more. I'll try it. Yes, <laughs> Thank you. I'll and I appreciate all the work that uh, you know, the force has done to bring this to this point, so thank you. All right, can we have a vote on that? Um, to have a meeting with the public before what we leave that on the motion. So yeah, the motion. The motion on the floor. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We may not be able to accomplish that before your next meeting. Okay. Yeah, I'll try. But um, this is a time reasonable time frame. Yeah. Yeah, we should avoid self inflicted wounds whenever possible. <laughs> <laughs> well said. A beach community is affected in any smooth, even the minute way, I would say it always moves. I am to bear speech to this day about parking at Pine Point. All right, Thanks. thank you guys. All right, what's the next one? Garbage and recycling. Uh, all right, item eight, discussion on the amendments of garbage and recycling. Mr. Hall. Yes, Home Forks uh, has. It's a really good experience, 10 years and better with a curbside program, and they come forward with a host of fairly small, I think, fairly innocuous uh, prescriptions, something like this phrase. Um, but rather than looking to clarify uh, yard waste, uh, I think that's born out of the fact that um, from time to year we see all sorts of material uh, out of the curb, and this is really intending to be very clear and direct as to what's acceptable and what isn't. Beyond that, um, and, and I think we we'll probably be all witnesses as we travel starting the roads, uh, some folks choose to leave their cans out of the side of the road frankly, all the time. And so this is uh, intended to be very clear that uh, bring it down for your day of collection and, and bring it back to your property that same day once it's, once it's empty. Now, we'll use discretion if people are away, and, you know, but this is really intended to address the, the chronic situations where people just leave them at the roadside. And it's particularly troubling this time of year with plowing activities. Um, and in the summer too with all the lobster shells in there. Fair enough. Uh, they, people may want to get that can as far away from their home as possible for that reason. But it, their real problem is logistically in the winter, I think, with plowing activities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Discussion? Are they finding the, the uh, in terms of the issue number one, which was the, what was the earth and the soil and whatnot? Are finding that in the barrels or just at the roadway? I think yes and yes. Okay. Both in the barrels but also piles of debris, including sand and grit. Just hoping that someone's going to come along and right. take it for them. Yes. And the reality is we have a contractor. Those drivers are forbidden for, they don't get out of the vehicles for right. safety reasons. So uh, anything that doesn't fit in that can and can that mechanically be lifted in is not. If they threw it in, the stuff in a garbage bag in their can, 
Uh, believe it or not, Ecomain is getting really particular. They actually dump contents of each of those Packer trucks on the floor and visibly inspect. I can wow. send you, I get a weekly report. Can you imagine that, Charles? Percentage, of, percentage <laughs> of contamination. And uh, it might surprise you, we have more contamination in the curbside, uh, in the cans, than we do in those uh, roll-off dumpsters. That really? Interesting. I would have thought that that's where you'd see the most abuse. Um, well, that's why I asked the question, because what I, what I have seen is people, if I put it in a garbage bag, then it must be okay. <laughs> Versus yeah. it's not necessarily. Right. Even they with like hazardous, hazardous, hazardous materials, etc. They know which truck it came on, they obviously don't know what house it was attributed right. to. But they know the root of that truck, right. and they can start to narrow things down. Yeah. If it's and they're really cracking down. They're in the business of making energy and making electricity right. out of burning the trash. And so having um, you know, proper products uh, and in a pile of sand uh, doesn't burn well. Yeah. And, uh, so I, oh, sorry. So I actually, you know, I'm fine. I support that. Um, I am a little concerned about same day removal. Like, you know, but again, I, I guess I would trust that the PE are going to be discretionary. I know for, you know, for me, in a busy household, two working people, you know, sometimes it's 24 hours before I get my barrel back in. Sure. Well, that's so, actually where I move now, I, I do it right away. But when I lived uh, at Lucky Lane, it was that was not an easy trek up. So if the weather was pouring down rain, I had to wait till the next morning to get my barrel moved out. <laughs> so, no, you'll see some you folks know, uh, with long driveways will actually have a little. It's in yeah, the car belt that they put it at. So our, our issue is away from the side of the road. Right. The road. If they put it somewhere else yeah. on the property, you can add it. Well, I guess I'm just saying I would probably argue for 24 hours instead of the same day. But Well, you could either leave it to our discretion, and we're not about making life difficult, or you could add maybe you know, on the day of collection or as soon as practical, practicable <laughs> thereafter, you know, to add some level of wiggle room. We really wanted to make the point of making the effort. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that on one day. You know, again, because it's not like we're going to be running on a break tickets or whatever. Everyone's got a card out there. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a particular problem with day up, but I've also been, you know, you can track my garbage can performance, you know, even <laughs> with uh, Truth comes young men in our house, additional, you know, sons. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, I can say I violated that one too. So we're learning a lot about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 truth. Any other? Uh, what do you want to do, guys? Uh, I think. Oh, it, to get I think that we could add the disclaimer, kind of. Yeah, you know. What's the correct word? Practicable. Practicable. Practicable yeah. yeah. Within 24 hours. Sure. Or, you know. My thought is on uh, page six, article three, section four, one. So we'd add that language after the word collection. Yeah. On the day of collection, uh, or as soon as. Or as soon as practicable, but no longer. Well, three weeks. That's very subjective. Because practical, I would say, within 24 hours. Practical. What if? What yeah, if that's what's practical. What's practicable to me is like Friday. Yeah. Practical to you. Yeah. That's why I said within three weeks. Yeah. You get an answer. So if you say 24 hours, that's that's not that's that's finite. That's like definite. There's a theory in law called the reasonableness. Yeah, it's reasonable right. standards. So what, what would a reasonable person do? 24 hours. I don't I want to go into 24 hours. 24 hours is reasonable? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So with that change, would you guys be willing to move for the council? Yeah. yeah. So I'd say something like in no event more than 24 hours. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that sounds good. It's like, so I, you know, sometimes my trash will get picked up late in the day. Like, yeah. if, it, if it's in the middle of the big snowstorm. And then yeah. I yeah. Actually, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Because yeah, then I'd be worried about the clouds. I'm going to get my husband. Yeah, I know. I know. Would you stop? Again, no event more than 24 hours. We'll have a chance to test this with snow this weekend. Yeah. 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 All right. So we have a motion to make it formal. Uh, I move that we vote in favor of this as proposed for the additional language that uh, is as, as, uh, provided by uh, Tom Hall. Second. All in favor? Okay. Shellfish. What are we doing in here? Shellfish. Uh, any 
any change to the Shellfish Conservation Ordinance requires the Department of Resource approval. We have sent uh, these changes, you know, there's really changes in two different categories uh, to DMR for their review. Uh, we sent it in October, we still haven't heard of it, totally uh, contacted them again today. So this is really before you maybe to introduce the notions, and I must admit on part of this, uh, I don't quite understand how it works. Uh, but in the first instance, and this is something that uh, actually Travis Turner, uh, as the I mean, chair of Shellfish, really uh, feels strongly about for purposes of conservation activities. Um, they want to make sure that at least four hours of the 12 hours that are required are done doing survey of the plant plants. And what's important about that, and I think the council may appreciate this, is that annually there is a recommendation on license allocation. And some of the data that should help inform that discussion in terms of how many licenses we should issue that is how's the health of the, the stock. And the surveys are critical in assessing that. And what we've heard is that when given the choice, the clamors will often choose other conservation than the surveys, such as eradication of green crab and other things, whereas they really want to make certain that we prioritize survey because that data we think is really important. So that's the first change. Um, and then the second one, what they've said to me is that they want to introduce in the lottery system, this is an annual lottery that we've held forever, uh, is something like the moose lottery. I never tried to get a moose permit, so I don't really know what that means. Uh, but the notion is that um, apparently they want the ability to earn bonus points if you participate in lotteries and are successful. And there are folks that have been in the annual lottery for decades, perhaps, and have never been lucky enough. What I honestly don't understand is how those bonus points are actually applied, whether you're able to put in your name twice, or three times, or four times, and that's the benefit. Uh, so I think there needs to be some further clarity around this, but I hope you get the sense of what they're trying to do is to give a chance for these folks that continually, year after year, I'm sure, and to somehow give them a priority going yeah. forward. Yeah, I get the intent here, but I, I have to admit I I uh, uh, don't know how it would work. You know, I, to try to level the the plant plants, level the playing field for the folks that don't get picked. So, yeah, it, you can't do anything until DMR comes. Well, right, so we've got time. I was going to say, I think we just table it. We'll yeah, and I know. DMR says. Yeah. I'll invite a member of the Shellfish Commission to come to your next meeting. Yeah. Right. Explain yeah. not just the intent of in practice how it would work. So I'll motion to the table until our next meeting here. Second. All here. That's it. I do believe. Motion to adjourn. Uh, I, I got one quick question. Can I speak about agenda items going forward or ask a question about that? So. Is that something we should do offline and we can talk? Uh, we can talk. Uh, Let's we'll see. Uh, with another question. <laughs> okay. Motion oh, to, to adjourn. Second? Should I ask for Second. 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 All in favor?